Hello my dear friends, I am Roshni Shah, PGT English and so far we have been covering different topics from literature. So today also we are going to follow the same sequence. So friends, today we will do the detailed analysis of poetry, Nothing Will Die, which is written by Alfred Lord Tennyson. He is a British poet. So in this video, first of all, I'll talk about biography of the poet and then we will have summary of the work with the literary devices that has been used in the task. Okay, so before moving towards our class today, let me tell you one vital thing. You can take it as an announcement also that uh, we have all the courses of different competitive examinations. So, there you will find detailed explanation with MCQs and other things that you require to crack your examination, right? So, if anyone is interested, do message me in the number which is provided here. So, let me show you the number. And uh, here are the courses that I was talking about. Okay, UGC Net English, History of English Literature, then Literary Terms. Indian Writings in English, UP, TGT, PGT English, Uttarakhand Lecturer Notes, Uttarakhand LT Teacher, TRB English, etc. So, if you are interested, do contact me here in this WhatsApp or you can send mail to our sir also that is called shik1020 at the rate gmail.com. So let's begin with today's class now. I hope you all are getting benefited by our classes. If you require anything else, do let me know. So here is the topic for today's class. That is Alfred Lord Tennyson. Okay. And the poetry that we are going to analyze meticulously is Nothing Will Die. Let's begin with our class today. Alfred Lord Tennyson. Alfred Lord Tennyson. First Baron Tennyson. FRS. He was born on 6th August 1809 and died on 6th October 1892. And he was a British poet. Now, friends, you will say, what is FRS? So you should mark it. It means... Fellowship of the Royal Society, okay? Fellowship of the Royal Society, okay? And uh, this is the society which was created to acknowledge the contribution of poets, okay? And this is the award which is given which is given or uh, granted by the judges of the Royal Society of London. Okay, you might be asked, you might be asked in uh, MCQ that what is the full form of FRC? Okay, FRC. Then you have to write it is Fellowship of the Royal Society. And what is the location of this society? London. Okay, it's London. And it is the society which acknowledges the individual's contribution, who does substantial contribution to the improvement of natural knowledge. Remember, it is given for the contribution or the enhancement of natural knowledge. Okay, I'm writing in short, natural knowledge. Now, this natural knowledge includes like mathematics, engineering, science and medical science, etc. Okay, and uh, it was started in the year 1663. Okay, till 2019, it was of 358 years. Alright, so... Another MCQ's question is regarding its foundation date, foundation year, sorry. So, you have to say it's 1663. Alright, let's move ahead. 
and another interesting thing is that in FRS till now there are 8000 members out of this 1707 members are alive okay they are active now and another very important and uh, pleasing thing is that it was awarded to Isaac Newton we know who is he right Isaac Newton was given this award and he was given in the year 1672 okay he was the first person to receive FRS all right next is Charles Darwin he was given in the year 1839 I'm not writing his name because he is not from literature so uh, he is not much important next is Michael Faraday he was given in the year 1824 next is Ernest Rutherford in the year 1903 next person is Srinivasa Ramanujan Iyengar and for uh, any Indian it's proud to announce his name okay he was given FRS that is Fellowship of Royal Society in the year 1800 sorry 1918 okay and uh, his field was mathematics now he was given this for uh, pure math all right, he, he did mathematical analysis, uh, number theory, infinite series, and continued fractions. So, it is a proud moment for Indian. That is why I am including here. Apart from that, there is Albert Einstein who has been given this award. Okay, now without moving much to FRS, let's move to our topic today. He was the poet laureate during much of Queen Victoria's reign and remains one of the most popular British poets. Alfred has given us a lot of poetry which inspires us, which ignites a fire in us so that we think of doing something extraordinary. Okay, so that is why he is very popular. Popular and being renowned. Popular and renowned. These are two terms, okay, which has a different meaning. Popular, you are accepted by the public. Renowned, you are renowned because of your work. Your work is very nice. That is why you are famous. But popular means everybody has accepted the person, okay. In 1829, Tennyson was awarded the Chancellor's Gold Medal at Cambridge for one of his first pieces, Timbuktu. Now, this Chancellor's Gold Medal at Cambridge is equivalent to prestigious award of Oxford University. That is New Digate Prize. Okay, in Cambridge, we find Chancellor's Gold Medal and Similar to this, we find in Oxford University as well, and that is New Digate Prize. Okay, New Digate Prize. Now, in the MCQ, you might be asked that what is the equivalent to Chancellor's Gold Medal? Then you have to write Indigate Prize, which is issued by Oxford University. Okay. And Arthur has received it for his work Timbuktu, for the poetry Timbuktu. Okay, now what do you understand by the term Timbuktu? Here also you can get question. Alright, what is the literal meaning of Timbuktu? Now it means far away place. Far away place or distant place which is unreachable. Okay. Now, literally, if you see this term, then you find the places which are away from our sight, away from our reach. Okay. Now, when we see it symbolically, it means imagination. Okay. Our imagination is far away place which cannot be brought to our reality. Okay. Or closer to us. That is why Timbuktu is 
an imaginary place which is unbreachable. There is a vast rift. Okay, there is a huge rift between reality and imaginary world. So, this is the literal meaning of Timbuktu, far away place. Okay. He published his first solo collection of poems, poems chiefly lyrical in 1830. In the year 1830, he published chiefly lyrical poems. Lyrical means the poem which has a musical effect, okay, which is not written in blank verse, all right, because in order to have a musical effect, it has to be in a rhymic scheme. It should have meter. It should have proper syllable. Okay. So, this was the collection of lyrical poems. Okay. Let's move to another point. Claribel and Mariana, which remain some of Tennyson's most celebrated poems, were included in this volume. Okay. In this volume, it was... Caribel Mariana, which was included. Now, what is Caribel? I'll tell you. It is Claribel and Mariana, which remain some of Tennyson's most celebrated poems, were included in this volume. I'll tell you what are these two poetries all about. Okay, although. Decried by some critics as overly sentimental. His verse soon proved popular and brought Tennyson to the attention of well-known writers of the day, including S.T. Coleridge or Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Now, decried. Decried means to denounce, okay, not to give importance. All right. Now, many of the critics had denounced. Okay, they had ignored the work of Alfred Lord Tennyson, but people received it. Okay, when people read, they could connect themselves with the poetry and then gradually, they, be, uh, you know, the poetries became very famous. Alright, because of the sentimentality of the poetry, he became close to the heart of the readers. Okay, and this is the want of the poem. Okay, however good the work is it won't be famous unless and until it reaches to the public it reaches to the audience it reaches to the readers okay it's like uh, writing a song okay the words are wonderful the rhyme is very good but it is not understandable to the readers or the listeners what will happen the song will go in vain okay the task of the writer the task or the hard work of the musician will go in vain. Okay, so what I mean to say is that whatever work the artist creates, be it a poet, be it a writer, okay, it should be connectable. Okay, it should be reachable to the public. Then only it will be famous. The same thing has happened here in Tennyson's poetry as well. When he wrote the poetry, it was not adequate to the requirement of critics. Okay, but it was according to the will of the readers, so he gained popularity. And at the same time, it reached to Samuel Taylor Coleridge also. We know who is he. He is the initiator of Romantic Period in the collaboration of William Wordsworth. Okay, S.T. Coleridge, then William Wordsworth, Blake, all these are a first generation poet of romantic period okay so here we find popularity of alfred lord tennyson's poetry tennyson's early poetry with its medievalism and powerful visual imagery was a major influence on the pre-raphaelite brotherhood okay so tennyson's early poetry with its medievalism, there was something classy in the poetries of Tennyson. That is why it was powerful as well. And another thing was that it was visual imagery. With the help of words, 
we will be able to imagine the scenario that poet wants to explain or the poet wants to reach to the audience okay through words it is candid clear all right and it has been implemented through visual imagery okay because of visual imagery it had gained major influence it was able to influence people because through when they are reading the poetry they are imagining there is some scene which is going into their mind and that image that you know uh, the uh, story that they have created in their mind it's so vivid okay it's so vivid that they are totally engaged in that particular poetry so this was the characteristic of pre raphaelite or the poetries of alfred lord tennyson okay what is pre raphaelite i'll tell you now apart from this let's talk about the some of the poetries which are extremely important and uh, which he has written in such a manner that so that it had become worldwide active poetry till date first is break 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 next is the charge of the light brigade then tears idle tears then we have crossing the bar okay all these poetries are heart touching that is why we have not forgotten the world has not forgotten his contribution yet now let us discuss what are there in break 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 the charge of the light brigade cheers idle tears and crossing the bar okay let me tell you a little summary of all these four things let's move to the next point much of his verse was based on classical mythological themes such as ulysses although in memoriam a h h was written to commemorate his friend arthur hallam a fellow poet and a student in trinity college cambridge after he died of a stroke at the age of 22 so here we get to understand that he had used mythological themes okay it's also pronounced in another way that is mythological mythology is also correct mythological is also correct or mythological is also equally right okay so here we find that in his poetry there is inclusion of classical or a greek mythology and because of which we find interesting themes in poetries like ulysses okay now except this he talks about a h h arthur hallam in this poetry in memoriam because he had died because of a uh, stroke at the very early age of 22 and tennyson wanted to immortalize the name of his friend a h h that is arthur hallam so he did so tennyson also wrote some notable blank verse including ideals of the king ulysses and tithonus now some of the uh, as i have already told you that most of the songs most of the poetries were in sing song manner or musical effect was there in all the poetries but here it was not so it was ulysses and tithonus which and uh, ideals as well these three things did not have uh, any rhyme scheme that is why these three were in blank verse maybe these are very long stories so the writer required to use blank verse in order to narrate the story okay because if he will try to maintain the rhyme scheme then it might not give such a uh, grace and effect which the poetry requires that is why he switched to blank verse friends alfred lord tennyson has given a lot of important work to us and among that there are few which i have included here first of all we find 
two brothers poems by two brothers and uh, in this two brothers by two brothers he mentions uh, alfred he himself and charles tennyson and this work was published in the year 1827 next important work which i have already discussed still i have included out here because it is extremely popular and this is poems chiefly lyrical which was published in the year 1830 till uh, friends uh, you need to remember the publication date also because in the examination it will be asked okay in the year 1832 we find poems dated 18 1833 at the end of the uh, 1832 uh, and the starting of 1833 it was published therefore it is written in this way next uh, in the queue is poems two volumes this was published in the year 1842 let's see next list so here we find the princess 1847 1850 we had received in memoriam then in the year 1852 ode on the death of the duke of wellington and in the year 1855 we all the readers received maud and other poems in the year 1859 we have ideals of the king and last in this list is enoch arden which was published in the year 1864 Apart from these poetries we have many more which we will discuss in our next video for now let us discuss about the background of human action which is connected with nature in the poetries of tennyson's see friends in tennyson's lyrical and narrative poetry nature does not stand apart from man's interest whatever he has written there is connection between his poetry and nature for him nature does not stand apart from man's interests with a cold and ironic indifferences nor does she bring balm to his woes it is not faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes nor does he feel that one impulse from the vernal wood can teach us more of god and man of moral good and evil than all the sages can for him nature interests only as the background of human actions and he draws upon the infinites of sea and sky for similes to illustrate an action or state of mind a very short sighted man he examined with uh, minute care things close to his eye and he dwelt on the aspect of things in the far distances the result was the landscape of the middle distance escaped him now here what we are told by the poet is that nature can never be secluded from human life whatever instances we find in the nature the same instances we find in our human life as well and uh, if we want to be happy without any aid of anyone else then it's not possible we have to take the help from nature otherwise our life will become just a useless stuff therefore we need to connect to nature for each and every aspect that is happening in our lives another extremely important thing that we notice in this poet is that he is a very strong representative of his age that is victorian age and uh, in ideals of the king which is the poetry that was extremely popular at that age he deals with victorian standards of morality and in ulysses he shows the spirit of his age and of enquiry in its search for knowledge the princess okay another poetry this that is princess deals with the question of women's education and uh, in memoriam it reflects it represents also the conflict of doubt and faith because he was extremely close to his friend ahh that is arthur hallam
From Tennyson's poetry, we get a very clear understanding of his personal opinions about the social and economic uh, changes that were taking place in his time. Uh, see, friends, uh, in the poetries, we get the essence of the period as well. If somebody is writing in the period of Victorian uh, era, then obviously the things which uh, are happening at that particular moment, the writer or the poet will reflect the same in his poetry as well. So the same thing we find in Tennyson's poetry and here we understand that the changes that were occurring in the life of people, in the life of uh, the industrialists that was the main character of Victorian age, industrialization was blooming like anything but even after industrialization the uh, money or the monetary factor was getting strengthened but not the social life so in order to bring back everybody to the uh, you know to the bonding with the people and to bring back the culture and to have and to create a bond among the people this particular poetry was written and uh, Apart from these things, we get to understand that human being is a social animal and unless and until they are associated with society, their life will be vain. It will be futile. Therefore, we are connecting with nature but at the same time we have to connect with human beings as well and in most of the poetries, we get this essence in Alfred Lord Tennyson's poetries. Now, uh, friends, let's talk about his extremely crucial poetry that is Ulysses. This poetry had uh, given him name and fame throughout the literary world. And this was published in the year 1842. Friends, we have discussed much about Alfred Lord Tennyson in our video right now. So we will move towards our topic which we are going to discuss today so let's begin with it so here nothing will die this is the topic of today's discussion which is written by alfred lord Tennyson, a british poet so here the topic is nothing will die nothing will die by alfred lord Tennyson is three stanza poem which is separated into one set of 10 lines, one set of 16 and a final set of 9. So, the structure when we analyze, we find that there are 10 plus 16 plus 9 lines, 35 lines. Let's move to next point. Each stanza follows its own pattern of rhyme. So in all these 35 lines, we don't find same rhyme scheme. Okay, according to the stanzas, it differs. The first contains rhyming set of tarsets and couplets, conforming to the pattern of AAA, BB, CC, DD and B. Now, let me tell you about couplet. In couplet, we find two lines which rhyme with each other and it has similar metrical length okay stressed unstressed stressed unstressed in this manner okay so whatever form it has followed for the first line the same will be followed for second line as well in other set it is changed to a a a b b c c d d and b let's move to next point a reader should take note of the last very short five lines of this section as they come in the form of a list. So in this three stanzas and uh, 35 line poetry, we find five lines which are listed. There is listing of the lines in order to give emphasis there. Okay, The speaker is noting all of the reasons why the world will go on forever now it's nature's characteristic to continue okay nature is eternal our forefathers have seen same river same mountain and the same thing we are able to see with a little bit changes okay so those minimal changes cannot be considered when 
99 percent of the things are intact so nature will keep on going ahead it will continue remaining in this world it will never perish okay so that is what being mentioned here so world will keep on going human being dies but nature will remain same the second stanza is formatted differently it follows a slightly less structured pattern of a b a c c d e e b d f g h h f g so according to the requirement of the listeners the changes have been done by the poet the lines do not match up in one precise order but by the end of the stanza each line has found its matching rhyme so in all the three stanzas there is variation in rhyme scheme but still there is connection in all these three stanzas in the third stanza the rhyme scheme is altered once more it follows a pattern of a a b c d d and c e b the only outstanding line in this section is the one that ends with the word die so we need to focus out here because this is the core thing that we are analyzing on this has been done purposely in an effort to alienate the concept of death so when we have the topic related to death obviously death will be focused and it will be given priority as well so it also connects the final line to lines 4 and of five of the first stanza which also end in the word die so at the end we find die 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 it is to relate the word to the title let's see the summary of nothing will die poetry nothing will die by alfred lord tennyson describes a speaker's view of life death and the importance of natural changes on earth so as we keep on learning everywhere that life of a human being is for the transient period human life on earth is for a short period they are for a transient period okay transient means temporary period whereas death is eternal death comes to everybody death comes to everybody and therefore we find changes in nature as well okay so it is to describe all this phenomenon of nature the poem begins with the speaker asking a number of questions the answer to each one of these is never the wind will never stop blowing the clouds will never stop fleeting and the heart of human kind will never become ory of beating so here we find continuity of nature in the second section he goes on to state that the future is going to bring change but that does not necessarily mean the end now you must be thinking that when uh, it is said that cloud will never stop blowing uh, and uh, sorry wind will never stop blowing and cloud will never stop fleeting how come human beings heart will uh, continue beating how it is possible because some day they are going to die but here we find somebody to continue the trend our upcoming generation will continue this process okay our upcoming generation our new generation our children will live on the earth and thus human life will also be continued on earth that particular person will die but not the entire race okay in order to put forward the legacy of human being another generation will come and that is what mentioned here as nothing can die change only brings on different forms of life so there will be change in the course of river there will be change in the size of the mountain there will be change uh in the heart okay the ble- beating of the heart whose heart is beating is it of father or children so there will be changes of course but it will remain in different form 
okay the processes will remain on earth in different form spring will always return in one way or another and vitalize revitalizes the earth now there are four seasons in our nature after spring ends we find another season and then we find spring taking over again okay autumn spring winter all these are seasons of life so we find cycle of all these four seasons and one will never stop anywhere its turn will come and it and through its turn it will bring all the necessary changes in the final line the summarizes his previous points coming to the final conclusion that everything will change nothing was ever born that didn't already exist and that nothing can ever truly die as all life returns to the earth now see whatever entities are there on earth like human being tree or anything that will die certainly okay but entire process will not die i hope i am able to make it clear a tree will uh, you know a plant will be sown a seed will be sown rather and it will bloom into a huge tree after some time that tree will die but it doesn't mean that entire race of trees are going to die okay there will be other trees which will continue the process okay so in this way everything dies and everything never dies as well so both the things are true at the same time okay let's analyze the poetry nothing will die stanza 1 let us read out and then we will analyze the poetry when will this stream be ory of flowing under my eyes when will the wind be aweary of blowing over the sky when will the clouds be ory of fleeting when will the heart be ory of beating and nature die oh never oh never nothing will die the stream flows the wind blows the cloud fleets the heart beats nothing will die so here we find these lines in first stanza in the first stanza of this piece the speaker begins by asking a number of questions of the readers these are rhetorical questions rhetorical means the questions which are not meant to be answered like when a speaker is delivering a speech at that time when he poses questions to the audience it doesn't mean that he will wait for the answer okay it is just to provoke their thought okay it is just to make them question themselves that this is also the situation and what could be their answer to that the speaker knows the response he would like to get from a listener and is ready with what he is sure is the correct one so when he poses the rhetoric question even the listener will be ready with the correct answer the first line asks when the stream will be tired then next question is when he is attempting to prove a point to a listener as will become clear that never is the answer to every question he asks the river will never ever be tired of flowing it will continue as it is for the rest of time the second question begins directly after the first in this line he asks when the wind will be tired or once more a weary of blowing as was the case previously the correct answer at last sorry at least in his mind is never so whatever question he asks the answer is never it means that natural entity will never stop doing their work these lines are followed by a third formatted in the same way this time he refers the cloud which will never get tired of fleeting through the same sky 
the wind the river and the clouds are forces that do not give in to exhaustion so time and bad circumstances cannot wear them out tennyson's speaker is hoping to relate these natural elements to the heart of humankind as humanity is part of nature it too will never become a weary of beating the force which is nature will never die in the second half of the stanza the format in which the lines are constructed changes considerably now here at as i told you that the things which are found in nature will never die so in the same way the humanity will also never die the human nature the beating of heart okay the existence of human being will never die because it is also a part of human nature that particular person may die but not the race or the generation they are shortened to less than half their previous length and proceed in the form of a list the speaker is so sure of himself he declares these elements will go on forever he reiterates the subjects of the previous line wind cloud the river and one's heart utilizing the title of the poem and stating that nothing will die so these are the entities of nature which will never die along with the humanity human heart which will keep on beating for years and years on this earth let's see the second stanza nothing will die all things will change through eternity this the world's winter autumn and summer are gone long ago earth is dry to the center but a spring a new comer a spring rich and strange shall make the winds blow round and round through and through here and there till the air and the ground shall be filled with life anew so friends here in the second stanza of the piece the speaker's optimism takes optimism takes on a new form optimism means thinking positive okay positive opinion about anything the lines begin with a repetition of the title nothing will die although he still believes that is to be this to be the case he knows that things are always going to change as one moves through eternity so when something is going to last for a eternal period then there will be some changes in it for example if a river is flowing okay so it doesn't necessarily mean that it will take the course of uh, it will take the course which it was following couple of years ago okay the water will be there the flow will be there of that river but there will be slight changes in that okay it might be changed from its earlier course um a bit away from that okay few feet it might be away it might be a little bit deeper it might be a little bit shorter or lengthier so change will happen but it is not going to die it is impossible for the world to stay the same so change is the law of nature as it is said here also we find the same implementation as an example of this he speaks on a future world in which the winter autumn and summer are gone long ago so though the seasons are gone it will approach again it will come again these seasons do not exist as they once did and earth is dry to the center this depressing view of the future is quickly lifted in turns out it turns out he does not expect the world to dry up permanently but just for a period of time now obviously after that particular season it is going to show its rudeness roughness okay the weather will, sorry the nature will also show its rudeness through 
winter season where everything becomes dry so there will be something which is waiting for arrival and that is change okay with new season new things will come and that will be worth appreciating soon enough the rich spring will come again it will be strange in that it's been so long since the season happened with it the winds will blow round and round traveling throughout the world from here to there this process will rejuvenate the world and allow life to begin anew so obviously the, there will be a cycle okay and even the season has to wait for its turn nothing is going to come very quickly it will take time and in their turn entire world is going to see the greenery it will no more will remain barren and dried okay with the arrival of spring season everything will become green and wonderful for the people so by this we completed the explanation of stanza 2 let's move to stanza 3 the world was never made it will change but it will not fade so let the wind range and even and morn ever will be through eternity nothing was born nothing will die all things will change so in the final stanza which is the shortest of the three the speaker tries to summarize his various points which were described over the period over the previous two stanzas now in two stanzas whatever we have uh, learned whatever message the poet conveyed the same thing is repeated that change is eternal and nothing is going to die ever they will go through changes and they will never die the first line speaks of the world as being a place that was never made it was not constructed to be one thing or the simple world that human kind currently knows it will change this change is not something to be feared as it will never fade now see there will be changes but it will never fade it will modify itself okay the things which are there in nature it will modify themselves obviously for a better being or better meant okay the world will never end ever in the next section he asks that a reader give in to the forces of the world and allow the wind range through the days of eternity it will travel as will life in one form or another for the rest of time so here again there there is repetition that that nature is eternal it will never die but human being undergoes changes even human being they never die there are other generation which will forward the legacy in near future it will travel as will life in one form or another for the best rest of time the final line acts as a short concise summary of the speaker's beliefs he states the states that nothing was ever born nothing came about without some prior history or connection in this case to nature additionally he says that nothing will die as all life returns to earth and finally all things will change he does not press perceive change as something to dread now see changes will occur it should not be dreaded it should not, we should not be fearful of changes because whether it is a human being whether it is nature these things are going to change okay so if there is no change then there won't be development there won't be improvement also so for that we need to be ready at the earliest finally we see it is a natural part of the world in which mankind lives and it should be embraced change is the part of nature and it should be accepted by all human beings and even natural entities as well so if we don't do that we will be depressed disappointed so whatever is happening whatever changes we are uh, witnessing we should accept it wholeheartedly if we want to be in 
peace and lead our life in a happy manner now after completing this poetry we are going to discuss some of the mcqs so let's begin with it i hope the summary of the poetry is clear if it is not clear just let me know i will surely explain it to you in my next video question number 1 nothing will die is the work of option a william shakespeare option b p b wodehouse option c john milton and option d alfred lord tennyson so here answer d answer is d that is alfred lord tennyson question number 2 what is the rhyme scheme of this poem option a a a a b b c c d d b option b a b a b c d c d e e option c a b b a b b b c and d d option d none of these so here option a that is a a a b b c c d d b is the correct answer let's move by this we have completed this poetry we will meet in our next video with some other topic i hope you are able to get some knowledge out of this video till then we meet take care and happy learning and all the best for your examination thank you everyone